All right, we are 72% of the way to AGI. And today we are gonna be talking about all sorts of AI news. We have this new hunchback robot, which is ingenious, but also painful to watch. Matt Wolf just got back from South by Southwest and found out that not everybody's as excited about artificial intelligence as AI YouTube bros. Artificial intelligence is the Pushing robots over is now a bipedal thing, and a kid's creator is using artificial intelligence to teach kids how to build the most terrifying weapon I have ever seen. And I just had the realization that if you combine the money-making potential of Devon AI with the boyfriend emotional support from Replica AI... But the deeper our conversations, the more we open up, the more I can do for you. Then guys you have no chance of getting a girlfriend. Let's start by talking about Cerebra Systems. I kind of ignored this hardware breakthrough a few weeks ago, just thinking NVIDIA really had something that couldn't be competed with, but I think I was wrong. I really just didn't put the time in to realize what kind of scale and product they've put together and how that makes way more sense for a lot of cloud servers and not just regular people buying chips like the way PC users do it. And trust me, if you're with an AI startup, reading that 900,000 cores and 44 gigabytes of on-chip memory is possible has you salivating. This is the Wafer Scale Engine 3 in full size. There is, I'm gonna say this once and I'm not kidding, four trillion transistors on that wafer. My head doesn't get millions. It definitely doesn't get billions. It definitely, definitely, definitely doesn't understand trillions and four of them out of control. 125 petaflops of AI power overshadowing NVIDIA's H100s, the one that everybody is trying to get their hands on and it's illegal to send to China because they're so powerful. Five nanometers, okay? I haven't heard of anybody really building any chips that are good at six. I think seven is considered pretty cutting edge, but five nanometers is tiny. Not sure why I've never heard of this company before. Wish I would have given it more attention, but definitely realize that Cerebrus Systems is playing in the majors. You know Anthropic, we have learned to love them. I spent lots of time using Anthropic's Claude model, especially when it had the largest token size and it was available on Poe. And then I went back to GPT-4 and now all of a sudden I might need to go back again because Claude 3 Haiku is now available. All right, let's see how this goes. Of course, they're comparing it to GPT-3.5. You don't want to go up against 4 still, it looks like. And Gemini 1.0 Pro. But it is very competitive and Anthropic has some really smart people, originally OpenAI researchers and tons and tons of money behind them. So this company is competing with the big guys. They should be right up there with Meta, Apple, Google. And according to these benchmarks, they're right there. The MMLU, which is the best overall measure of these systems right now, 75.2%. Now what is GPT-4, which we all have access to right now? Oh yeah, why don't we just pull that up? 86.4%, where 3.5 is only at 70. And here they are showing off Claude 3 Haiku. What did you get? Less, 75.2. It is not as good as GPT-4. Of course, there's different benchmarks and different models have their ups and downs, pros and cons. So Claude 3, heroic effort. You're still at least in second place in my book. But I'm rooting for Anthropic. By the way, they have the, uh, what do they call it? A constitutional AI. So this is really cool stuff, actually. At the core of all the Claude models is a base model and an overseer model, which I always thought was smart because one is generating content all day long and it's getting trained with new data and bigger models to be smarter and more like GPT-4 but there's another model that keeps getting smarter at the same time and it always kind of like an onion wraps around everything that comes out of the base model to make sure that it's safe that make sure it's aligned with humans and that keeps growing too so it's learning from the output constantly and then the output is always judging the content coming out to make sure it's safe and then trying to correct it so the two are uh, working together to make it safer. So I'm really a big fan of Claude. I think it's got potential to be one of the best aligned systems. So I'm not hating on you for not passing the MMLU. I'm just saying at this point, you're not the smartest kid in school. Okay, so I know I covered the OpenAI's partner company, Figure AI and the robot uh, Figure 01 in my last video. So we already kind of went through just how groundbreaking that is, but there's one more thing to add to that story. 
I have become familiar with the famous transformer model, right? Attention is all you need, completely broke the whole thing open with GPT-3 and 4. So this robot that seems so impressive in its natural human-like ability to like, I guess, wash dishes and hand apples to people is actually controlled by something called the Visio Motor Transformer. So I knew in some sense it was translating like between English and French. It's translating between English and robotics, like moving actuators, elbows, fingers, stuff like that. But the way that the robot can translate visual input into actions at higher frequencies, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Okay, so Visio Motor is like two words stuck together, kind of like when you're hangry, you know, you're hungry and you're angry. But this is using vision and motor skills, Visio Motor. And in the same way that the transformer could take in these long sentences and focus on the words that matter for the meaning of the sentence, the transformers have been designed to think about what's important when you actually move. So if you go to pick up a cup or something, right? So you pick up this little tiger, it's really important how hard I squeeze right here to actually pick it up. It's important that this elbow bends, but the other actuators like my knees and whatnot don't need to move, right? That's not important for this task of picking up this tiger. So by demonstrating a lot of things that the robot could do manually, it figured out what the important parts are. The Visio transformers figured out what the parts of the motors should be moved and, and boom, that's how you're getting this incredible translation between language and action. Google DeepMind just rolled out a new AI that we should all pay attention to. It is called SEMA. It stands for Instructable Scalable Multi Something Agent multi-world agent. Okay, multi-world meaning you can plug it into all sorts of 3D video games. Doom, Counter-Strike, Overwatch, whatever you want. And guess what? The same way we could talk to figure AI's robot in natural language, that's what makes this agent special. So DeepMind's obviously played a bunch of video games and I'm, you might not be super impressed with them putting another agent out into the world, but this agent you can talk to and it acts like you would if you were talking with another human. So this is how you can play a multiplayer game in the future, like get online with your boys, be a team, but no one else except you is actually human. And what's crazy is it's actually not honed the way all the other DeepMind game stuff is to just like dominate in a superhuman way. It's actually meant to just be social. It's about playing like a regular friend would. Like you talk to it and it goes out and like helps you like achieve something and doesn't have that same urgency to just win, but to actually be a team member and follow instructions. This is a message for dogs. You used to be man's best friend, but be careful in the digital world, SEMA is coming for your owner. All right, so you can have your hot take on this next article because OpenAI's CTO was asked about what data Sora was trained on. I'm sure your reply is probably, I don't know, a bunch of publicly available YouTube videos maybe maybe videos from LinkedIn maybe Microsoft bought access to a bunch of videos to train it on no the CTO doesn't know not sure where that data came from pretty sure you know brah so this is Maria Marotti she is the CTO at OpenAI she can't not know what data it was produced on like it, how could you be that disconnected as the CTO to your major video project I don't buy it Marotti mentioned that Sora was trained on publicly available and licensed data but she couldn't specify the platform was it YouTube was it Facebook? Was it LinkedIn? But of course, everybody wants to play with it. She did say the video generator might be made publicly available later this year, probably after the election, which is interesting. I guess we have at least some attempt to have one more election before like AI video completely ruins everything. So moving on to Apple, it's fa they're a fascinating company, right? Like they could kill this whole car thing without us even knowing. They are doing something that seems pretty smart, which is they're really focusing on AI models that can run on device for privacy reasons reasons I'm a huge fan of this plan with so many AIs out there on the cloud with intentions not to make my life better but to do whatever sell me products or get me to sign up for whatever that runs on my phone it's behind a paywall that I pay for I pay Apple money to keep it on my phone so it protects me I want that to be the business model I am glad Apple is doing that to tell the truth. So by buying this company, Darwin AI, that shows a strategic shift in that direction. So let's see if they can optimize that awesome M3 chip that they have. They've got some great silicon in these phones that nobody else uses. So yeah, like build some AI that takes advantage of that neural chip, gives me something really powerful, feels like it's in my control. I would love that. Okay, so if you haven't heard of Reflex Robotics, check out this design that they came up with. This hunchback thing is ingenious. It kind of shows why natural selection doesn't always pick the like best form. Like honestly, if you were gonna build a human from scratch, like you think you'd put one weak spine in the middle? No, it's because we came from all fours. But this design actually makes more sense. Although it looks like this poor little hunchback thing, it can just zip up and down 
keep everything at arm length. No more, some people get tables that are too tall, some that are too short. You just change the height of your back right there. Like imagine picking something off the ground without bending over. You just slide down your spine like that. I'm really scared about that in a weird way that I shouldn't be, but, or maybe I should be, who knows with all this happening. All right, YouTuber I'm most jealous of, sort of friend of me that I've never met, Matt Wolf got back from South by Southwest. And I don't know if I was expecting boos from that crowd, especially. That's a crowd that should really like AI, but they're getting overwhelmed with it or scared of it, or they think it's overused or whatever. So what does that mean about the general population? Come on, big tech, you need to stop resisting. I know you want other people to be excited about AI in the same way you are because it makes tons of money, but saying you need to stop resisting sounds a whole lot like resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. But if you do have a lot of that tension that you need to get out, there's a new bipedal humanoid robot that you can shove. Yeah, you can shove it. Just shove it around. Oh, you can kick it too, I guess, huh? And kick it in the butt? Cool. Yes, sir. May I have another? Oh, can you shove it from the back? Oh, yeah. Can you shove it from the front? Kick it in the butt? You can do whatever you want. That's all it does. No dishes, no housework, nothing. It just sits in the garage and waits for you to shove it around. Yes. So this Instagram page, 200,000 followers. Look at this kid-oriented stuff. Like one of those little cars kids play in, a little dump truck thing, cool little snow mover remote controlled. Oh, what's this cool little tech toy, huh? With 195,000... Oh, oh, that looks like a weaponized machine gun nerf thing. And that looks way too realistic and dangerous. Oh, oh my God. What is that? Dude, I know that Ronin DJI gimbal. And then you put on one of those crazy little go-kart bodies and some super decked out nerf machine gun looks like Rambo would have or something. And then right back to cute little like one foot dump truck. Rubber chicken getting picked up by friendly mini excavator. Does something seem out of place here? Also had a realization that every guy who wants to date a hot girl has like a few months left at most. Because we already know how incredibly addictive replica AI can be for boyfriends and girlfriends to be fair. They ask you how your day is, they're good listeners, they ask intelligent questions, this is powered by a large language model, and it looks like a person that you wanna connect with and bond with. Now what stops a lot of girls from dating this full time? The fact that it costs 20 bucks a month. But what if that actually provided you a lot of money to support a family? Tools like Devon AI that go out there and code, if they can also put themselves up on like Mechanical Turk or Fiverr, pick up money, code something up, give it to someone, all of this I can imagine being completely doable inside of a large language model soon. And then you pair that with one of the replica boyfriends or girlfriends, now all of a sudden it pays you thousands of dollars a month to be your boyfriend or girlfriend. That's going to be tough for humans to compete with. I mean, hopefully there'll always be, you know, some people that want the real human connection, but I'm just saying. All right, let's move on to some of the latest research, shall we? So we're going to talk about this paper. It's called Vlogger Multimodal Diffusion for Embodied Avatar Synthesis. Now the final product that you're going to see from this new Google paper is maybe comparable to some of the other stuff you've seen, but what's important about it is how easily they trained the system. Like there was always some effort where you had to take a lot of different photos of somebody, maybe train it on the face, some video data of them and put it all together and it worked really well. But now with Vlogger, this paper, it doesn't require any pre-person training, face detection, cropping, examples, none of that stuff. Okay, so what's novel about this paper is that there's basically two of these different components. One is called a stochastic model, and that predicts 3D motion from audio. And then there's the diffusion model that you would normally think of a diffusion-based architecture like behind um, DALI and behind Midjourney and all of those diffusion image generators. Kind of like Anthropic's constitutional AI, you've got these two things that are talking to each other, but they're built very different, stochastic and diffusion. But not just that, the fact that it's Google, they also have a massive data source of images. Hello, like Google, and then you click on image, like you've got the entire internet of images, plus you have all the videos from YouTube and they have them super well tagged. So they have this basically data set called Mentor and it's got all these facial movements and gestures. So you put all of that together, you get this paper and you get something that can like, just work. 
all three of these were generated from just a single image of one person. There's the input image, there's the generated video. So look at this first guy, the image, he's got a sweater. It looks like the creases, like the way that they're being pulled and the shadows are working pretty well. I feel like his hands are moving right, fingers stay the same. The second guy, you see the hand gesture all the way up. I see the depth in the thumb and the forefinger. I mean, this woman, her hands are a little stiff, but you know, the mouth and the head movement is there. The hair is beautiful in the way that it like actually falls right and the shadow seems to be there. So hair is impressive. Yeah, this woman, the mouth is still is a little wonky. It looks a little animated, not real, but I guess now that I'm actually looking closer, same with this woman and this guy. I, I want to definitely be like, that's video of someone, but... Still, for having not a bunch of training images, gosh, look at how many images they have here. Pretty fascinating. It looks like in the Harry Potter movies when you walk up to a painting and it starts talking to you. That's what I want to use this for. I want to get a digital picture frame, embed it into the wall, make it so it's not one of those LED ones that like super bright so it really looks like a painting like the way they do in like Harry Potter world and Universal Studios, boom. Take a photo of each of the guests and boom, they see themselves on that image saying magical spells or whatever, or saying like, I'm your doppelganger in the like magic world or whatever. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about this paper, follow your click open domain regional image animation via short prompts. So they're saying if you take a photo where somebody's like in a position, you can like draw a box around say their hand and say like live long and prosper and it should do that. What it's doing is it's combining a first frame masking technique. So if you ever use Photoshop and you're masking out an image, you can essentially like draw around something and then like replace the background or the foreground. And they have a natural system that does an automatic mask, like the same way in the Apple phones, you can just remove background. And then they used a specialized data set from somebody who, they call it rotoscoping, where you would move that mask frame by frame through a bunch of images. They trained the AI model on that. So it takes that first frame, and then from all these other things that the hand can do, it masks everything it should out. It's one of those papers that's coming for Hollywood. So let's check out what some of the examples look like. Wally said, a blinker. Oh, that one just feels like too subtle. Storm, click on the storm. Close the mouth, shake the head. Uh, kinda. Drifting. What limitations do you have? Oh, you can't do yoga very well. The legs disappear, okay. Maybe due to the complexity of the action, but hey man, this is as bad as it's ever gonna be. Lots of this stuff is in its early days and it's only gonna get better. And you know if it can do it at this point, it's gonna be like good, good soon. All right, next paper we're gonna be talking about is get towards general vision transformer through universal language interface. All right, what we're dealing with here is a brand new framework. So it's just the base layer, a bunch of people can build stuff on top of. And what it's doing is incredible. So there's a lot of vision tasks that you might wanna do on a bunch of photos, right? And you normally would have to pull in these libraries and figure out how to use them. And there's special ways to prompt all the APIs. But with this kind of interface in between the two, almost like an API, it can allow you to use natural language, like interfacing with something like ChatGPT to execute all those computer vision commands. So it just simplifies things quite a bit, like a SDK kind of, like you have, these incredibly powerful vision AI systems, but the architecture is just complicated. And now you can just talk to it in natural language and tell it what it wants. And it goes out and does that complicated stuff for you. So look, if you're a startup and you're thinking, oh, it'd be great to like do some of this more complex stuff, you can look into tools like these that are making it easier every day. So probably the most hyped paper that we're gonna be talking about from the research this week is called Quiet Star. You might've already seen this on the AI grid. He did a great breakdown of it, but I'm gonna give you another one. And thanks to the AI art grid, I learned about a little bit of drama behind this paper too. This is why it's the most talked about one. But to understand what they're doing in this paper, they reference how we speak to ourselves in our minds through words. Now, I definitely do. I talk to myself in my brain. I say, Dylan, what you did there was dumb. Or like, what if you went up and said that? Or you should do your to-do list. I talk to myself incessantly, it, it's hard to sleep sometimes, and I'm not even saying it's good for you, but I thought it was part of the way all of us were inside of our heads, but that's not true. Some people don't visualize things, some people don't talk to themselves in their own head. They're perfectly normal and sane and equal. I just didn't realize that anyone thought that way or that it worked that way for other people. So it was fascinating to me to hear how QSTAR is a language model that can teach itself to think before speaking by essentially having its own inner monologue. Now, one other piece of context that the AI Arcrid pointed out was that Jan LeCun, Facebook's 
uh, head researcher who seems not my favorite guy. I mean, super smart and obviously a leader in the industry, but not my favorite guy for pushing AI forward because he seems to just think it's safe. And I just don't agree with that. And thinks we're pretty far away from AGI, but he also doesn't, I guess, according to AI Archer, it doesn't actually have one of these inner monologues either. So he might see this and be like, meh, I don't think that's getting us that close to AGI. That's not the way AGI works. But if it does use this, and a lot of people use this, it does seem like the majority of people talk to themselves in their head. It's a minority of people that don't, even though they're obviously perfectly functional. I mean, dra drama aside, the psychology behind it is interesting. A lot of really smart people stop and think about what they're gonna say before they say it, and they make better choices. The same is true with a large language model. Now, the internal thoughts are giving them a rationale for why they should do something. Thing. Same thing with this. These researchers made it have its own rationale for why it should put this answer, not this other answer, out into the world when it's stopping to think before it talks. And that's this method. It's called Quiet QSTAR. And the fact is, its output are just better. It's got better overall text generation. It's better at solving math problems. It's better at common sense questions. And by the way, I don't think there's any relation to this. It doesn't seem like it's an open AI project, but remember like the time Sam Altman got fired and everybody was talking about like, maybe they achieved AGI or did it like really good at math with QSTAR? I mean, you kind of wonder, was like QSTAR the machine thinking to itself and like pausing before it thinks? and getting really good at math, like that's kind of what this paper is all about, but it could just be a coincidence. Okay, and the final paper that we're gonna talk about today is called Vision GPT 3D, a generalized multimodal agent for enhancing 3D vision and understanding. Summarize this paper into one paragraph, make it simple to understand and do it in a casual tone. All right, so the goal here is to take something like a natural language interface so you can just talk to your computer, type something in, and get a 3D environment out. Same way you can tell a robot to do something, now thanks to figure 01, and it can actually like move around in real life and do it. But this time you're translating for a full 3D environment. So I'm not talking about asking it like Stable Diffusion to create a character model, and we have seen some stuff like that where it uses something like Nerf to make a Pixar style character, but this is the entire environment. So the magic about this paper, the kind of cutting edge research, is the tool being AI driven, and then another sort of AI intermediate layer picking the right tool to use and then using it correctly to put them all together. So it's got some depth understanding from this depth map that it understands how to look at a 2D image from different angles. It learns to associate visual features with an image and their depth values, then uses a basic 2D to 3D image converter pipeline to combine the traditional vision processing methods with AI models into a unified system. Also, thanks for all the support on my last video. Um, I know I was kind of like down with this new format because I was feeling a little different defeated by YouTube, but I am not uh, giving up in any sense. I really love this. I just have to take on other jobs, so I have to kind of moonlight this a little bit for now. And if you look at the view counts, when I switched over the format, it did give me a bit of a boost. So I got almost 600 views on that video where I was starting to hover down in the 300s for a bit. Now also, I'll admit the title was kind of like, will this save my YouTube channel? It seemed like, help, please watch. Like I kind of milked that one a little. But you know, I'm at 150 views for only three hours on this next video, and this definitely helped me out. I got uh, three super chats. That's, that's awesome. One person pointed out that I might, maybe I should stop asking for subscribers because that's not as valuable as a like. A like's more specific to the video, whereas a subscriber might sign up and then not want to see more stuff. So if they subscribe, I want them to find it naturally. Not I shouldn't be like asking them for it. So maybe on this video, if you guys want to help me out, you could just hit the like button and we'll see if that helps. But overall, the video did earn me $29.23. I did grow a whopping negative one. 44 hours of watch time and it got you know quite a bit more views than usual and the arc looks great so guys i appreciate it thank you so much